Jack shivered. What an absolute Satan this man was. How could he just sit there and watch them as they went down the hill toward certain disaster? His own men, how could he do that to them? He knew that line was there. Why didn't he warn his people before they hit it? Because he is the devil, thought Jack, and the devil does things like that, even to his own. Jack blinked and felt some better for his part in the tripwire. If Betelgus would let it happen to his own men, then maybe Jack was justified in setting the trap. The townspeople would think about this later, and some of them, maybe one or two, would figure it out on their own. Maybe. He rode along, and presently he started thinking about sundown and chatty again. As he rode along, thinking about them, it suddenly came to him that they were worth a thousand horses' legs and a thousand riders. Just like that Bible story, the one about Pharaoh's soldiers in the Red Sea. Just like them, sundown and chatty were worth any number of victims, just so long as they lived and thrived. That was worth any price to him at all. It was late that night when Chatty and the Sundown Bandit made their way into Iron Gulch Pass, exhausted with fatigue. The place was pitch black dark, and had Chatty been awake, she would have been terrified merely to be entering such a ghost town. They entered the town from the far end, where all of the stables were located. The stables were still there. It was just that no one would be coming out to greet them and give them a welcome. But sundown had loads of provisions stocked in these abandoned buildings. She had basically her own self-service town here. They made their way up to the stable doors, which were now open all of the time. They rode inside, and Sundown reached behind her to rub little Chatty Dawson's head. Wake up, Sugarfoot, she said. We're here. Where? asked the confused, groggy Chatty, blinking in the darkness. She sniffed and made a confused noise in her little throat. Inside my private stables, young lady, said Sundown, affecting a halfway decent English accent. I'll thank you to climb down and tend to my horse. Chatty slid off the saddle and stood, trying to get her balance in the dark. Her head hurt her, and she couldn't see anything in this barn, or wherever it was they were. It smelled like a barn, so that made it one. She sighed and blew air out of her cheeks in despair. We'll water him, said Sundown, and then we'll stall him. Hay's already out, and there's a well out back. She lit a match and walked over to one of the lamps out here, lighting it. The room filled with an ominous glow. Sundown went out the back, into the darkness, and she flipped the lid up on one of the old wells, smelling the dank smell of the water down in the darkness. Lowering the bucket, she felt it splash as it touched the surface of the water some feet below the stone ledge. The weighted bucket sank into the brackish water, and when Sundown felt the full weight of the bucket full of water, she cranked the hand lever to bring it back up again. Soon she had a bucket of water resting on the stone ledge of the well house. The bucket was large enough for two horses, and the sundown bandit carried the bucket back into the barn, where Chatty was busy taking the saddle off freighter like she had seen Sundown doing before. She had Freighter's saddle off now, along with his underquilt, and she had a curry comb out, ready to wipe him down a bit. Good girl, smiled Sundown, into Chatty's exhausted face. Give him a lick and a promise tonight, Sugarfoot, and I'll take him up to bed. 
We got all day tomorrow to check the nails and so forth. There's a complete smithy right in here. Is there a hotel right in here as well? Groaned Chatty. You bet you, smiled Sundown. And my own private room will be ready for us, too. I got us a nice jug of fresh water right here to take upstairs. She took one of the funnels she had, unwrapped it, and she filled a couple of old bottles she had sitting in the corner. The bottles had caps on them, and so Sundown recapped them after she had filled them with her well water. Then she rewrapped her drinking funnel and replaced it on the shelf with the other bottles. I've done this before, Chatty, and it's a good idea to take some water up to the room with us. I always get dry in the middle of the night, and I hate that, you know? So do I, said Chatty, tasting her dry tongue. I'll take a sip right now if you got it. Sundown smiled and unwrapped a long silver ladle. All of her things she stored out here were immaculately wrapped to keep out the dust and vermin, and Chatty thought nothing of drinking right out of the bucket. Sundown was terribly neat for an outlaw. Chatty quickly wiped freighter down with the old rag in a lick and a promise style just to get the salt off of him. The water was like liquid life to Chatty. She was so dry. She slurped and guzzled all she wanted. There was still plenty left for sundown. One bucket held an awful lot of water. Chatty wondered how sundown had been able to carry it from the well. It must be terribly heavy. Sundown walked out of the horse stalls, leading Freighter by the reins. She led Freighter out of the stables and across the street to the old barber shop. Inside, she had constructed a ramp over the steps leading up to the second floor. Up here, behind a padlocked door, Freighter the horse had his own private second-story stable, complete with straw and water. From outside, no one would think to try and open a padlocked door on the second story of the barber shop to search and find, of all things, the horse of the sundown bandit. It was ingenious. She kissed the horse good night and came out of the room, padlocking the door behind her as she left. She went back outside again and saw Chatty coming towards her, carrying their gear. Chatty belched, and Sundown laughed. She even belched sweetly, this kid. Sundown had never heard anyone belch so sweetly before. Sundown couldn't help but note how knowledgeable Chatty was with the horse. In school, Chatty told her. They have a course that they don't tell any of the students' mothers about. It's called Home Economy and Survival, but on the course list it's just plain old home ec. But in this class they teach you things like how to shoe a horse and how to curry one as well. They show you how to do everything a man might have to do in case of a survival situation. If the man in your party gets hurt or dies, and you have to do things. Really? asked Sundown, impressed. I'd like to take that course myself. Chatty smiled in the dark. You will, Sundown, she said to herself. Starting tomorrow, the Sundown Bandit becomes a lady. Chatty Dawson kept that to herself and did not say anything. They walked across the dusty road, dark as midnight sin, and they walked up to the old sidewalk of the town, towards the great hotel-saloon combination. It was the biggest building in town, and Sundown took especially good pride in showing it to Chatty. Chatty had her things in her bags, but she didn't want Sundown seeing all of her stuff tonight, nor asking any questions. Tomorrow morning, after they ate, 
Sundown would get the full treatment. She was going to be positively thrilled with the change. They went into the empty saloon, and it was like walking into a mausoleum. It was so cold and dark in here. Chatty swallowed in fear, looking around her to see if any of the ghosts still lived in this ghost town. She grabbed Sundown's arm and hung on for dear life. Sundown chuckled a little bit and said, Welcome to the Lady Luck Saloon, my child. Over your head there is the upstairs of this fine establishment, and it doubles as the Lucky Arms Hotel. It's one of the finest hotels ever made. If the Iron Mind had not have caved in, killing untold dozens of people, this place would still be in operation. Sundown smiled soundlessly in the dark, and led the poor frightened child up the grand, creaking staircase. It's safe, love, said Sundown, as the steps under them complained about each of their footfalls. Never fell through yet. How long you lived out here in this spooky old place, Sundown? asked Chatty, still with her death grip on Sundown's arm. By yourself and all. Oh, let's see, recounted Sundown. I came up here several years ago. There's a few settling noises in this place, but I find that it is a thousand times better since people left it for good. People are scared of things like spooky old houses and buildings, but I'm afraid of people, Chatty. That's it in a nutshell. The devil has to have people to work through, and the only way he can get by is by getting into them. She looked at Chatty, who was staring up at her. Ghosts and things can't hurt you, because those people are dead. The devil can't get you, save there be living people around for him to use. I find, Chatty, that the more people you get, the better the devil works. That explains mobs and riots, don't it? You have a few people, one or two, and everything's pretty laid back. You get a crowd, and you watch the attitude change. I hate people, Chatty. I like individuals. Persons. Persons like you I love. But people? Nope. There ain't no love in people, Chatty. Just persons. Only in the individual is there a speck of anything decent. You always quote Bible, Sundown, said Chatty, but you aren't Christian. Sundown looked down at her and shook her head. Baby, she said, the best thing you ever did was get a copy of that book and read it cover to cover. Oh, forget the hymn singing and the foot stomping and all the sugar frosting. Just read it as if it was a penny dreadful novel. Then remember what it says. You'll be changing your ways before long. You'll be wanting to change your ways. But you're not a Christian, are you, Sundown? I am what I see, love, said Sundown. I started this life as an outlaw with a daddy who had a Bible in one hand and a gun in the other. That fellow Jesus would have been more at home out here in this empty town than he would have been in River's End with that crowd of people. The devil lives in crowds, Chatty, but in the heart he can't get a real firm grip. It's the lonely who are closest to God. I think sometimes he's lonely, and I am too. Maybe I just feel some better thinking that way, but it works. I believe what I see, Chatty, and there ain't no explanation for all this madness except the devil. That book's got some answers in it, I think. It ain't clear enough, so most people wants to read it. Here, I want to read the Bible, but I'm evil. It says, though, we're all evil, and that makes me feel better, knowing that. There's a story about a publican praying and a sinner man. The sinner was justified, saying he was a sinner, and the publican's prayer went unheeded. 
That's how I hope it is with me, Chatty. Being an outlaw, nobody loves you. You gotta be your own lover most of the time. You gotta get right with the force of the world, cause as an outlaw, you live pretty close to your maker all the time. It makes you wise with a gravity you wouldn't believe. I've been close to bullets whizzing by, and chatty it makes your whole life flash at you in a second. I tell you this, in that second, your own life means that. She snapped her fingers when she said that for emphasis. If your whole life goes by in a second, then you ain't been alive but a second. To him. To God. Chatty marveled at this strange, enchanting, and very lonely woman in front of her. So you want to go right now, do you? asked Chatty, as they went into one of the bedrooms upstairs and stood together in the dark. Sundown put her arms around Chatty and held her close. I see it this way, she said. I've been visited by an angel, Chatty, and this here angel is from him. I wanted you to live through that jailbreak so bad that I swore off my favorite thing in the whole world. Still can't believe I did that. But I did, and I aim on keeping my word. You lived, and I got to get you back safely home again. I feel like you got something else to say before then, but yes, you must go back home after you tell me whatever it is. I'll have to let you go again, and I think it's going to kill me. But I deserve to die anyway. So let it be over you, rather than some bullet. Let me die grieving over you, Sugarfoot, and I'll die quick. She held her close and for one minute didn't say any more. They just stood holding each other and saying nothing. After a time, Chatty spoke to her. I ain't never going to leave you, Sundown, she said softly. I done decided that. Sundown smiled and kissed her on the head. You at fourteen, she said, looking down in the darkness at the girl. You'll say that. You at fifteen might say it. You at eighteen will be smelling after something else. The blood thing you have gets worse. It don't get no better. You'll be scratching against every post from here to Dodge City, wanting a man to mount you like a bull. Chatty winced at her graphic expression of the Copulation Act. You don't do that, Sundown, answered Chatty, sniffing the slight hay allergy she had developed out here. You ain't crazy for a man. That's cause I am one, doll, she said. I ain't been to no finishing school like you have. I see what you got in your bags there. I know you're planning to doll me up like a woman and I'm aiming on letting you do it. But you're going to try to make me want a man, aren't you, Chatty Dawson? Chatty sniffed and listened to the older woman. I used to get hot over robbing banks and trains, Chatty. Being a man and doing a man's business, being like a man made me hot. That's a perversion, I know. I'm not a man, and doing man's work as a woman is perverted. There's thrills in perversions, though, Chatty, but they're shallow and unfulfilling. Still, they get you by for a while. I know what it's called. You don't have to tell me. It's a Greek word. I got it out of one of them old dictionaries I picked up out in the prairie. It's called kleptomania and it gets women hot to steal things because of the screwed-up way they're made. You and I both have problems because we ain't never had no decent mother. Chatty Dawson could argue with none of this. Sundown walked over and she lit a lamp with one of her trusty matches. The room glowed nicely rather than dingy. Chatty saw that the room, while stuffy and with bad air in it, was as pretty as any hotel she had ever been in before. Sundown smiled and whipped off the spread of the bed, throwing dust and things clear of some nice white sheets. 
Fanning away the airborne debris, she trimmed the wick on the lamp and put it beside the bed so they could better see. They just up and left this pretty place, said Sundown, marveling. They said it was all cursed and that Lady Luck had left her saloon. But it's lucky for us, huh, Sugarfoot? We got a nice place to sleep tonight. Sundown raised the window a few inches to get some fresh cold air into the room. Then she went over to the fireplace and found enough wood in the scuttle to start a nice blaze to warm things off a bit. Chatty Dawson stripped off her clothes and got into the cold sheets and just her underpants and undershirt. She had a bra, but she had unstrapped that and took it off, feeling it as it freed her from its binding strap. It was a nice itch it gave her to remove that bit of harness from her body. Her nipples stood out from her chest. Now tomorrow she'd let the sundown bandit try the bra on to show her what it was like. It would be a bit tight on her, but it would serve well. Chatty did need a bra, or she wouldn't be wearing the thing. She wasn't like a lot of the girls who just wanted to wear one. Chatty really didn't like wearing one. She would have preferred to just have to wear her undershirt every day. So she wore both. Her mother couldn't understand that at all. Sundown stripped off and joined her in a few minutes. Chatty crawled over toward Sundown and hugged her close. She gave her a sweet little kiss. I'm going to miss camping out with you, Sugarfoot, said Sundown. I think I'm going to miss that most of all. Chatty squirmed in close against her and didn't say a word. She was asleep in seconds. Sundown lay there stroking the child's hair for the longest time. She faded closer and closer to sleep. Chatty's breathing made it easy. After a while, she reached over and slipped the wick down into the amber liquid. And except for the reddish glow in the fireplace, the room was totally dark. Neither of the two exhausted women moved before sunup. They were after him again. He could feel them like an angry beast. The posse that Betelgus had formed might have been made up of fools, but fools could kill you the same as anyone else. Right now he had about eight fools coming for his blood. He had hurt them as a group, and now they wanted a large piece of his backside. They would skin him alive. He was actually afraid of them now. He didn't know what he was going to do, but he had about decided to do the one thing that they would not expect. The idea had hit him like a revelation. Of course, Betelgus's place. They would not look for him there. He would get himself into the barn and hole up there. The Betelgus farm was better stocked than most saloons with supplies and things. Yes, it was perfect. Who would look for him there? Amidst that mountain of hay in the barn, he could get what he needed and feed his horse as well. He'd just mix up old Queenie a batch of sweet feed from the main trough and hide her along with himself, in the storage stables at the end of the great hallway. Betelgus had pretty near a hundred head of horses in his barn, and when he fed horses, hundreds of pounds a week went through his troughs. He wouldn't even see Queen's ride, nor the fugitive Jack Jacobs, even if he did come home. The family never even went into the barn. They had hired hands to bring them out their horses when they were ready to ride. And those old boys were in such a daze from boredom they would never even see him. 
He had remembered a lot about the place when the silent shadows had gone there to steal Pythagoras, better known as Freighter, to sundown, and a bunch of other horses as well. They had stolen the horses for a grudge because some of their friends had been falsely accused by Judge Betelgus and sentenced to hang for horse-thieving. So the silent shadows had decided to show Judge Betelgus what horse-thieving actually meant. It had been one of the very few times that Jack Jacobs had been with the silent shadows. The Betelgus farm was going to be having a guest for the next couple of days. And wasn't Beetlejuice going to be pissed off once he learned about it? He might even leave him a note, thanking him for his provisions. Jack rode on now, feeling fatigue and cold. The temperature of the day had fallen down to night conditions. It was getting winter time out here. He shivered and pushed on towards the Betelgus farm, by way of the River's End River. The sundown bandit had overslept this morning. As she got up, she heard the sounds of someone walking down the long hallway of wooden flooring outside the door of this hotel room. The weight of little Chatty Dawson beside her was gone now and so was the gentle scent of her hair that had comforted Sundown at night so much. Sundown swallowed, feeling dry, and reached over to get herself a swig of her bottled water. As she sipped it, Chatty came into the room and eyed her with mock anger. Sundown smiled at her. She was gorgeous. Chatty was dressed to the teeth in her nice dress and boots, her hair was done, and somehow she had heated water and had taken a bath downstairs. She looked five hundred times better today than the little saddle tramp Sundown had bedded down with last evening. Sundown Bandit, said Chatty, racing around to the side of the bed. I never in all my life. She saw Sundown's rump stuck up in the air and she raised her hand and swatted her solidly across the butt with the stinging palm of her hand. It's almost eleven, girl. How am I ever going to teach you any manners like this? Get up. Sundown laughed and winced, shaking her head. Is this my head, mistress? she asked sweetly, ready to cane my wicked behind for being lazy. It is, said Chatty, and I have a cane as well. Now, if you don't get up, I'm up, said Sundown, rolling over to the edge of the bed. I'm up. Mercy, child. I have a long way to go with you, said Chatty. I can see that. Well, come on. They walked outside the room and into the hallway. They were going down to the end of the hallway, to the last room in the place. In that room was a half-bath and heating stove, that Chatty had used herself that morning. Sundown smiled. A hot bath would feel nice on these old bones this morning, she thought. Please, headmistress, said Sundown, demurringly. Might I sit a few extra minutes in my bath this morning? It would feel awfully good if you'd let me. Just don't diddle in there, said Chatty. I'll fix us some breakfast while you indulge yourself. Oh, go ahead and soak a while. Chatty Dawson had the sundown bandit by the hand, like a mother does her naughty daughter, and she led her into the room where a hot bubble bath was being prepared. By the tub was a shot of whiskey in a glass and some hot coffee, all ready for her. Oh, Lord, you are an angel, said the sundown bandit, whipping off the rest of her things and rushing to the tub. Well, said Chatty, I figure you deserve some pampering. I'll bring you something to eat later, when it's done. She lowered her head and whispered, I was in the tub an hour, Sundown. Isn't that sinful? Sundown smiled and nodded. Chatty shushed her with a finger to her lips, as though they were getting away with something, 
and she shut the door to the room. Sundown slowly eased her body into the hot water and sighed. She groaned in pleasure. A wave of pleasure shot through her stomach. The hot, bubbly water was perfect. Dear child, said Sundown, oh, you dear sweet girl. Sundown felt the rise of pleasure engulf her as her whole body adjusted to the heat in the water. Chatty had found some mineral spirits and had added them to the water. A bath mix called Green Lake's Delight sat by the tub, along with a tray that could be slid across the gap of the tub, so a person could actually eat and drink while soaking. Sundown lay back in perfect happiness. All of her aches began to go right out of her as she soaked and dawdled. Before long, she was awakened by Chatty serving her breakfast. Chatty was now setting up Sundown's tray over the tub so she could eat while she bathed her tired old bones. "'Eat your breakfast,' said Chatty cheerfully, "'and then I want to introduce you to some things you might not have ever seen before.' Sundown ate while Chatty prepared her supplies. She laid them all out as carefully as a surgeon. Sundown watched her with great interest. Lord, she must have combed the whole ghost town over this morning, trying to find all this stuff. But there it was, probably from all the different boarded-up shops that these people had so hurriedly abandoned after the mine had caved in. Sundown ate her breakfast, which was marvelous. She had bacon from a slab of that old salted beef down in the pantry. There was coffee and even toast from Lord only knew where. The kitchen downstairs must have been better stocked than Sundown had noticed before. Sundown ate like she was famished, and she drank her whiskey with her after-breakfast coffee. She sat watching Jaddy prepare things in small cups, and get things ready to do other things with. Half of this stuff Sundown had never seen before, but she had this growing feeling in her gut that by the time Chatty Dawson was through with her, she would know exactly what everything did. All through, asked Chatty, and Sundown nodded, starting to rise from the tub. Chatty pushed her sweetly back into the water saying it was not time to get out yet. No, ma'am, said Chatty, smiling. I think you need to do some things that you have never done before. Such as, asked Sundown, as Chatty Dawson came at her with a razor blade. It was a nice long straight razor from the barber shop. Chatty had apparently found it over near where freighter was stored, Along with these thousand other things, Chatty made a great scavenger. She brought out a small cup of mixed shaving soap and told her to stick out her left leg, please. What for? asked Sundown, getting nervous. I'm going to shave it, said Chatty, relishing this moment. Sundown cautiously stuck her leg out of the tub and Chatty wiped it free of bubbles with a small hand towel before she applied the soap. She lathered her leg up really well before she applied the razor to it. Carefully, she took the first swipe down her thigh with it. Now, said Chatty, meticulously shaving Sundown's bare leg, this is going to feel weird for a few days until you get used to it. Your leg has all this reddish, fine baby hair, but... It will grow back as stubble. It will, asked Sundown. Mm-hmm, said Chatty, smiling at her friend and patting her knee. And after I'm done, we'll do under your arms. Sundown felt herself shiver. Oh, just lean back and enjoy it, Sundown. I wished I had someone to shave me like this. I hate to do it, because it takes so long, and I can't reach places that I would like to. Sundown didn't ask where those places were. She had a feeling she didn't want to know just now. She hummed and carefully shaved Sundown's entire leg for her. Then she ran her hand up and down the smooth skin. 
allowing sundown to feel how smooth it really was now. She ran her hot little hand all the way up and down the bandit's leg, wiping off the soap and checking for stubble. The blade had been sharpened recently, so there wasn't any stubble. Feels nice, doesn't it? asked Chatty. Sundown reached her own hand down and winced a little. Her leg felt strange, like it was naked. She felt like a skinned rabbit. Chatty did the other leg, and then under her arms, and finally told Sundown to get out of the water. Sundown really felt strange when Chatty had been shaving under her arms. That had really felt strange. She had first trimmed her with scissors, and then scraped up one side and down the other. Sundown was beginning to feel like a plucked chicken. Once Chatty was through trimming on her, she was already feeling funny, like she might not belong in blue jeans anymore, like she might belong in a dress. Without all of her hair to protect her, she might just be stuck wearing dresses from now on. Now, said Chatty, regarding the great bush Sundown had between her legs, let's do something that will keep you from smelling in polite society, Sundown. You won't be wearing jeans, so you'll have to be more conscious of your smells. Women have delicate clothing, and they have to be extra fresh, or it tells on them right now. There's no heavy denim to be masking it for them. Sundown didn't know what she was talking about. But Chatty handed her a pair of scissors and smiled. Sundown looked at her thick thatch and then looked at Chatty. You need to lose about three-quarters of that sundown. In fact, it would be nice if you shaved it all off. You'd feel more ladylike. Sundown held the scissors and said, You're kidding, aren't you? Trim yourself, said Chatty. I'll be right back. She went out of the room while sundown took a deep breath. What would that feel like, being shaved up down there? Did she want to trim herself like this? She'd better. She didn't want to fall foul of Chatty Dawson. Not this morning. Sundown started clipping her pubic hair. Chatty came back a few minutes later with the strangest bottle Sundown had ever seen. She figured out where it might go. She was just hoping that it didn't go where she hoped it wouldn't go. It was filled with a vinegar solution, and it did go where Sundown hoped it wouldn't. Oh, crap. This was the worst part of all. The thing called the douche. Chatty held the other part of the apparatus up high, the bag end of it with the solution. It ran down this hose-like thing and into the bottom of the well, man-like thing that went where the sun didn't shine. It felt awful at first. Ow, do I really have to do all this, demanded Sundown, just to be a lady? The men will kill themselves to have you after this. Sundown was wondering if she wanted such a thing as that. She was better at killing men than she was kissing them. Sundown survived the douche, the trimmings, the shavings, and all the pluckings of errant eyebrows growing over the bridge of her nose. She hadn't even known she had hairs growing there. She lived through the earwax removal and the nose hair clippings. She went through the teeth cleaning with the baking soda. And she lived while Chatty carefully painted each of her fingernails. She then painted her mouth for some reason. Then she painted her eyes. Then she painted her toenails. What are you going to find to paint and pluck next? That's about it, smiled Chatty, looking at her in a new light. Well, I feel like a painted horse on a carousel, I swear. I'm not yet finished, said Chatty. I need to do your hair. I found an old set of tongs downstairs in a trunk. Some woman had left them. I have them heating. Hang on a second tongs, thought Sundown. Great. Suddenly, she felt terribly ridiculous. Sundown had time to reflect as she waited for Chatty to bring the next thing of torture into the room. 
tongs for hair. What were they for? Sitting here in this room, Sundown realized something was wrong. There weren't any mirrors. Chatty had covered them all. She didn't want Sundown to see what she was doing until she was through. Wonderful. Chatty was enjoying this a little bit too much, thought Sundown. She was having fun making the Sundown Bandit into a woman. You are a woman, said a voice inside of her. That a fact? she asked herself. Is that a righteous fact now? Yes. Well, I can't argue with you there. I guess I am that, and it's high time I tried on the completed look. I can always go wash this crap off and let my stubble grow again. May as well humor the child. She's put up with enough from me, for sure. Chatty, the humored child, entered the room with a strange-looking thing that was steaming hot. It was a set of rolling tongs, or curlers, as they would be later called. They were red-hot, and as they sat in their holder, they glared ominously up at sundown, like miniature branding irons. Is this gonna hurt? she asked Chatty cautiously. No, clucked Chatty with a covered grin. Oh, I swear, Sundown, you are such a baby. Chatty Dawson, said Sundown, I have ridden you through a train robbery, a jailbreak, and an escape through the back country, but I have yet to threaten you with things like these. I would like to know what you are planning to do with all this stuff. Oh, horse pussy, swore Chatty, giggling like the schoolgirl she was. Sundown raised an eyebrow at that one and looked at her. Sundown, said Chatty, do you think I would do anything to hurt you, the scourge of the Wild West herself? I wonder, said Sundown, glaring at her. Everyone else wants to kill me. You just want to primp me to death. Chatty laughed and started in on her hair. She had washed it in the tub before she had gotten her leg shaved, and now Chatty was playing in it, cutting here and there and curling in places like she knew exactly what she was doing. She was having a ball. You have hair like mine, Sundown, said Chatty. It's as fine as baby's hair. It rolls and lays and does whatever I want it to do. It is such a shame to keep it under that filthy old hat all the time. You lost your hat, said Sundown, recalling the jailbreak. At least I still have mine, though it is pretty dirty. I lost your shotgun, too, said Chatty, biting her lip. I'm sorry about that. Sundown reached up to touch her small cheek. So long as I didn't lose you, Sugarfoot, she said, and smiled as Chatty's eyes misted over a bit. They worked on sundown for the better part of the morning. They felt safe here in the ghost town, and had no fear of any posse coming after them. After all, Jack was going to try and draw them off, or something. If there had been any trouble, he would have shown up. Sundown sat and thought of all this while Chatty played in her hair for the longest time. Finally, Chatty told her to stand up and come over to the bed. She got her some nice new underpants and bra. Another torture device wore sundown under her breath. What all else did that child find laying around this town? However, she did not say this out loud. She put it on and then said it was too tight. It's mine, said Chatty, but you can adjust it a little on the sides. It will go a size higher in any direction. For the first time in her life, the sundown bandit became aware that she had breasts. The bra made her aware of them, and it held them up like she was playing with them in front of the mirror. She felt shame creep onto her face as this bra made her nipples hard. It was molesting her, 
but Chatty managed to get the straps so they didn't feel so tight. There, sundown, that's all the room I can give you. As Chatty prepared the nice new black dress for her, something else she had found, along with the fancy boots that she had discovered, she felt really changed now, more like a woman. Son of a whore, she thought to herself. There really is a woman under all this grime and filth. She wondered what she would look like finished. Now, said Jaddy, I think the dress and boots will fit you. They might be a little bit snug. But let's, let's see. I'm so excited. I'm about to pee myself sundown. I swear, you ain't gonna know you. She slipped into the dress and Jaddy buttoned her up the back. It was a little snug, but it would work. Everything seemed to obscenely accentuate everything else in a womanly sort of way. You think this would be my actual size, asked Sundown. The mannequin I took it off of seemed to think so, smiled Chatty. There, I knew it would fit. You see, Sundown, women are miracle workers. You find that out as you develop. Now hold still, I have to get this pin out. I swanny they put more pins in these things than a hundred. Then the boots came next, after the stockings. What were these things made of, anyway? They fastened to her underwear with these weird little clips. The boots fit her perfectly also. Not a size one way or the other. Absolutely perfect. If these weren't so fancy, said Sundown, I could wear these out on the prairie. Stand up now, said Jaddy, stunned by her own handiwork, and let me look at you. Sundown stood right up, and she felt like she was wearing a Halloween costume for a woman. She didn't feel right. She felt like... like someone else. As she stood up straight at Chatty's gentle behest for posture, she was suddenly aware that Chatty was looking at her funny. Very funny. Sundown wanted to ask her what it was, but she didn't do that. She waited until Chatty put her hand up to her mouth and giggled. What is it with you, Dawson? asked Sundown. It's what's with you, Sundown. Ma'am, I mean. Sundown sighed, feeling terribly emasculated standing here in the clothes of a woman. All right, then, she said. Let me see what you've done. Chatty squealed into light and ran to get a comb for her to comb out part of her dew for softness. Then she pulled Sundown's hair up in the back, almost ponytail, but extraordinarily elegant. She pinned it back with a few small clips. More of this general store crap. No wonder women cost so much to have around. Now, said Chatty, close your eyes and don't you be peeking. I'm going to take you over to the big mirror. I want you to see who you really are. In fact, let's go downstairs to the big mirror. Closing her eyes, she took Chatty's hand and they walked out the door. The steps would be tricky, but Chatty would get her down them one at a time. Wait a second, said Chatty, running back into the room. I forgot your hat. I have it here. Let me pin it on your head. Don't move. Pin it on my head? Chatty did it in an instant, and Sundown wondered what this little piece of cloth was doing on her head. It wasn't any hat, at least none she could feel. One of those show hats for fashion and what not. It certainly wouldn't protect her head from the sun. They made it downstairs together, and with great apprehension, Sundown at last stood before the great mirror behind the bar, ready to open her eyes and see herself as a real-life woman. Chatty cleared her throat and said, I cleaned this glass this morning, and you'll see clear as a bell sundown. I want to prepare you before you open your pretty blue eyes and see the woman I have made out of you. You are no longer the sundown bandit, Sunshine Jacobs. From henceforth, you are a right pretty lady. In fact, a gorgeous one. I admit it. You're prettier than me, and I am insanely jealous of you, girl. Now open your eyes. The sundown bandit opened her eyes and became Sunshine Jacobs in a flash. 
At first all she saw were two women standing there looking at her, but she didn't see herself at all. It was like Chatty and some strange woman were looking back at her out of a window. Was that her in the mirror? And then it hit her, my God, that's me. I am a woman, and I'm beautiful. I'm even prettier than Chatty Dawson. That's impossible. No one, nothing is prettier than Chatty Dawson. But it was true. The woman before her was simply ravishing. Dressed in the black dress and a small black hat, she was wearing perfected makeup, and her eyelashes had never been that long in her life. Her lips never this full and pouty. They looked like Chatty's almost. Her cheeks were never this high and strong, her hair never that clean and styled. She felt herself getting turned on looking at the woman in the mirror, sexually aroused, like a man looking at a nice shot of leg he himself would like to have. But it was herself. She was making herself hot just to look at her. And then all of a sudden it hit her. No, this wasn't her. This was someone else, a picture she had seen briefly as a child, only for an instant in time, and Daddy had snatched it away from her, telling her not to go through his things, slapping her hands for not respecting his property, as if a thief could have any respect for anyone's property, and going through his things like that. Mother. Great tears fell onto Chatty's makeup job as a flood of emotions both sexual and tearful, found their way onto the woman's face. This was a cruel joke that Chatty had done, and yet she had no idea this would be the result. This woman in the glass was her own dear mother, with the large bosoms and insatiable milk supply. Her own dear mother who had died, giving her life. It was the woman in the picture. Mother sobbed sundown as Chatty tried to figure out just what had gone wrong. She didn't know what it was, but she figured that she'd better not ask about it just now. Jack Jacobs made it to the Batelgas farm about three that morning, exhausted and cold, wounded and sore. His butt was a throbbing mass of flesh. The wound was a surface wound, but this cold weather was making it ache like a son of a gun. His foot was cold, too, as was his right leg. Three rounds he had taken from the Winchester, and all three of them hurting worse now than when he had been hit. He exhaled and could see his breath. Oh, it was cold out here. The house was dark, and all of the hands were in bed, in their own quarters. He slipped quietly past their house and made his shadowy way to the great barn. There was no lock on the door, though there ought to have been one. They had suffered a robbery here at his own hands several years ago. They never learn. Jack Jacobs opened the barn and carefully led Queen's ride in behind him. Inside it was pitch black dark for a few seconds until his eyes adjusted. Some of the better than fifty or so horses in this barn had now smelled him and were making the low threatening noises in their throats. The noises were designed to warn the others, rather than to scare him off. They snorted and me, 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 me. in their throats, showing their displeasure at the strange smell in their barn. Jack walked down the long rows of stable stalls, down to where he knew there was an open door. In this room there would be a storage area for sweet feed and other little-used items. The door was bolted with a drop bolt, and this he lifted to open the door. The drop bolt would have to be locked again while he was inside, but if he did this just right, no one would know he was in here. Leading his horse back into this back area, littered with trash and junk that these lazy hands had thrown back here over the course of months, he turned to see the door again. As he was studying how to lock the door back from inside here, he had an idea. There was a rake handle lying near his feet. By lifting the door latch with the rake handle, he could close the door almost shut, 
and then whipped the rake handle back inside as the door came to. As the wooden latch was falling shut, he could get the door closed the rest of the way, and it would have just time to latch before the door bolt fell too far to catch. He tried it. The wooden piece began falling, and he shut the door all the way. It fell right into its cradle, locking him inside here. Perfect. He sat the rake handle down and turned to try and see in the darkness of this room. There were no windows in here, and so it would be about this dark all the time. That would be fine with him. He saw above his head where he could crawl out over top of the rafters and get whatever supplies he needed. He was so glad they had robbed this place before, and he had had an opportunity to see what was where. He climbed up the wall, still in the pitch dark, and made his way up to where the ceiling beams opened up to form the room over the entire barn. This way he could get out if he had to. He crawled straight up the wall, using the slats left by the wood in the walls as leverage, and he winced as his buttocks stung him like a yellow jacket. His leg ached, and so did his foot. He made it to the top of the wall, a good ten feet straight up, and found himself in the loft. Up here he could find a lot of things he would need. He found a lamp with some oil in it, and a striker flint in the base of it, an old smithy device. Was that their striker flint? But Jack knew full well how to get fire out of one. Perfect. He found a white sheet, torn into neat strips. Horse bandages. Perfect. They were all pre-soaked in lamp oil, and there was a brown glass jug of lamp oil by the box of strips. He found some old horse blankets to keep him warm, and these he threw down through the hole and into the room in which he would be living. Then he tossed down the box of the pre-soaked sheets as well to wrap himself. He would lower the jug of lamp oil with the twine in his back pocket to keep the bottle from breaking on the way down. After he did this, he found, of all things, a supply of food in the form of a twenty-pound bag of peanuts, still in the shell, and ready to eat. Oh, he could eat a bait of these monsters. He slipped one of the bags over the edge of the drop-off, and he let the peanuts fall. It fell, landing with a whump in the dark below him. Great. Now what else was up here? Let's see. Meandering around the loft, he found several bottles of whiskey stashed up here, no doubt by the stable boys, for use when no one was looking. He saw by the labels they had been stolen from the house. Quarter and half filled bottles of twelve-year-old scotch, Glenfiddich, Kentucky Sour Mash, Sutter's Choice Number 8. Great, perfect wound dressing and antiseptic. Plus, he would get a nightcap to help him sleep well. He could have asked for no more out of any barn, or for that matter, any saloon. This was a plenty for tonight. He made his way over to the darkened drop-off, and either lowered the rest of the stuff by string lines, or just dropped it directly below him. He had used five pieces of twine about eleven feet long to lower all of his goods down, and tomorrow he could spend the morning tying his twine back into a single string again. He eventually got up enough energy to climb back down, and as he started to do so, he felt his buttocks stinging him deeply again. Grimacing and wincing, he got about halfway down when he gasped in a great agony of pain, trembling from lack of food, water, and sleep, as well as medical attention. Jack Jacobs fell the rest of the way down into the black void. He hit something hard and uttered an unintelligible curse word before blacking out. He was out for about thirty minutes. His head swam, and he dreamed the wildest things. He dreamed he was having sex with sundown. They were naked together in the cabin, and he never thought of her that way before. But the bump on his head had scrambled his memories. In the dream, his head was splitting. He woke up. There was a light on, and in an instant he knew he had been caught. He remembered falling, and now he remembered where he was, and he cursed himself for not being more careful. A mistake like this on Betelgus's property would get him hanged at once. 
Hello, handsome, said a not unpleasant female voice from somewhere. He strained his eyes to see, and saw two of her until his vision cleared enough. He sighed heavily and moaned. The girl looked at him with her sweet seventeen-year-old eyes, and he knew why he was now feeling sexed up. He knew why he was shivering. He was naked. This girl had undressed him and was now dressing his wounds and drinking his whiskey herself. She had been nursing his wounds with his lamp oil mixture in the whiskey, and he had been totally treated while he had been asleep, dreaming those awful dreams about sundown, his niece. "'Welcome to the room,' she sighed, and walked over to stroke up the fire again. He hadn't seen a fireplace nor a fire when he'd come in earlier. "'The old fire keeps going out,' she said. "'Who are you?' asked Jack. And what is the room? She giggled at him. It's where bad little girls go after Mama whips their naked tails, she said. If Daddy was here, he'd kill her for this. I can't wait to tell him either. She had been in here all along, listening to him come in, talking to himself, leaving his horse. His horse, Queenie. Where was she? He looked around violently. "'Your horse is over there,' she said, reading his worried look. "'I unsaddled her and wiped her down. "'You were out quite a while.' "'Thank you,' he mumbled, and fell back weakly against the bed she had made for him. "'You're welcome,' she sighed. "'Go to sleep, mister. "'Nobody will be in here till the late tomorrow afternoon at the earliest. "'It's part of my punishment, you see.' "'He nodded, but those were the last words he would understand before next light.' Jack Jacobs went to sleep as quickly as a well-fed infant baby. He did not stir again until morning. I lost someone like that once, Chatty was saying to sundown, as they were sitting on the rusted swing of the porch of the Lady Luck Saloon in the deserted town of Iron Gulch Pass. Sundown looked at her. Who was she? asked sundown acting a lot more womanly since her transformation into her own mother. She sat and primly wiped at the remaining tears that were still falling down her face, using a lace handkerchief that matched her outfit. Tamara Dawson, whispered Chatty, and the tears welled up in her own eyes. I told you about Demira Grable, didn't I? Yes, said Sundown. You said you hated her. I did. But Tammy, her sister, was different. Aunt Tammy was wonderful. She was a lot like you, Sundown. A real sweet woman. Chatty then proceeded to tell Sundown all about Tammy Dawson and how she had loved her. Sundown listened enthralled. Chatty said that every time Tammy would leave her, she would always give her a little something to remember so she could say it again to her next time. It was a little secret just between Chatty and Tammy Dawson. When Chatty had finished telling her all about how Tammy had been killed in Box Canyon riding a horse, Sundown asked her a question. "'The last time you saw your aunt,' said Sundown, "'what were those words she made you remember?' "'Love is for little butterflies like us,' repeated Chatty, with a faraway look in her eyes. "'That's beautiful,' whispered Sundown. "'It is,' agreed Chatty, and so was she.' And so are you, said Sundown, causing her to blush. You like to make me blush, don't you? asked Chatty. Yes, said Sundown. I do. Do you remember robbing us that night? asked Chatty, after a while. Sundown smiled at her. It was hard to believe this woman sitting next to Chatty Dawson was really the most wanted bandit in the entire Western Territory. I remember you, said Sundown. It was the only time I can remember now, but it was the only time I can remember when I wanted to be a man. You were looking at me like you could have eaten me alive. She looked at Chatty, who had gone totally crimson. You were in love with me, weren't you? At last, sundown, slapping her hands together. I had you going, didn't I? Chatty admitted, yes, she had been in love with the sundown bandit. I used to fantasize about you every night, sundown. You used to rape me, and I would let you. Now Sundown's face colored up. 
the great outlaw had been shamed to a blush at last. I didn't know you wanted me to brutalize you, said Sundown. Oh, I didn't really, teased Chatty. I just wanted you to, you know, I just wanted to think about you doing it. What it would have been like. It's just a stupid fantasy. You are sure one weird little kid, Chatty Dawson. Chatty laughed at her, showing her she was just joking with her, too. Hi, <sighs> said Sundown. Wait. Listen. Sundown raised her hand for Chatty to be quiet, and she cocked her head as if she heard something. Chatty's eyes grew wide with fear. Oh, no, the posse. They had not even thought about the posse until just now. Why had they been so relaxed, knowing that they could have gotten caught at any moment? Is it the posse? asked Chatty. No, said Sundown. Hush a minute. Chatty hushed. Sundown strained her ears to hear what she could. She was used to hearing different things coming and going out here on the prairie, and being an outlaw had made her acutely sensitive to the tiny nuances of different sounds, like the sounds distinguishing a coach and four and a posse. Even a stagecoach had its own sound from a distance. Sundown was very surprised to hear what she thought was a stagecoach coming this way. Come on, said Sundown. Where are we going? To the rooftop. Come on. They ran back into the Lady Luck saloon and back up the creaking grand staircase. They reached the top of the stairs and ran down past the room Chatty had dolled Sundown up into, and they went around the end corner. Chatty was surprised to see a door at the end of the little alcove. She had just assumed it was another room, but it was not. It was a stairway leading up to the roof. They went up to the roof and out the rooftop door, which was not locked. They ran across the flat portion over to the small railing that looked out over the dirt street of the town. Chatty had no idea a person could get up here and walk around like this, but they were doing it. Sundown had obviously been up here before. Looking out across the vast prairie land, Sundown grabbed Chatty's sleeve and said, Look, look at that. Chatty looked and saw nothing at first. She tried to see what Sundown was seeing, but her eyes watered from the sun being so bright. After a moment, she shielded her eyes and stared out again. See it? asked Sundown excitedly. No, what are you talking about? And then she looked again. She did see something. What is that, Sundown? It's a stagecoach, said Sundown. 